preached to be a prophet of the Lord. And just a few verses in the first book of Kings, third chapter, beginning at verse 5. Speak for thy servant heareth. Give therefore thy servant a hearing heart. I suppose it is almost impossible to exaggerate the importance of prevailing prayer. And yet it is the most neglected of all ministries. There are many ministries in the service of God. The most important is that of prayer. But it is the most neglected. I wonder why. Well Satan fears the power of prayer in the Holy Spirit. And he will do a thousand and one things to rob us of this ministry of prayer. We are at our best when we are in the spirit of prayer. We are most like the Saviour. For what he is doing now is praying. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. I say we are at our best when we are in the spirit of prayer. That doesn't mean we are always on our knees. But we are in the spirit of prayer. David said that Three times a day he would pray. That meant that he had three seasons. He would turn aside and get on his knees as Daniel did and pray. But we are to pray without ceasing. David said that seven times a day he would praise the Lord. By that he must have meant that he had seven periods. I, I wonder what would happen if we did that. He turned aside maybe for a few minutes and he praised the Lord. Didn't ask for a single thing. But he praised the Lord seven times a day, seven to three. Three times a day, he had his set prayers. Seven times a day, he turned aside to praise God. And yet he said, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now, <coughs> the great men of the Bible were mighty in prayer. If you want to be great in the true sense of the word, you must graduate in the school, the university of prayer. Abram and the Jews regarded him as their greatest ancestor. Greater than Moses, greater than David. For the Jews said to Jesus on one occasion, Art thou greater than our father Abraham? The founder of the Hebrew race. And three times over in the Bible, twice in the Old Testament and once in the New, he's called the friend of God. What a title, the friend of God. Why? Because he was on such intimate terms with the Almighty. He had his place, we are told, he got up early in the morning and he went to his place where he stood before the Lord. It was sacrosanct, it was sacred, reserved for God and himself. And we are told, God said, shall I hide from Abram that thing that I do? The friend of God, mighty in prayer. Moses, the great lawgiver, the prophet of God. He saved a nation from destruction. What a selfless man was Moses. He was the strongest man in the world and he was the meekest man. Meekness is not weakness. Stubbornness can be weakness. A person who wants his own way and thinks he's very strong. In fact, he's very selfish and very weak. Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. And when he was provoked by Miriam, his sister, she tried to put her finger into her brother's domestic pie, if you remember. And Aaron joined her. But uh, Moses didn't say a word. You know, it's very, very hard when... Uh, from the inner circle you get severe criticism <laughs> but Moses didn't say a word and we read in that context that God said that he was meek above all men on the face of the earth what a strong man so God took the matter in hand and said come here Aaron and you Miriam and you Moses and God settled the issue and he said to Miriam and to Aaron how dare you speak as you have done about my servant Moses I speak to him face to face. I speak to the prophet, other prophets by dreams and visions. But I speak to Moses face to face. Moses was of course mighty in prayer. Mighty in prayer. 
40 days at a time alone with God. And so we could go on. Samuel, we read from Samuel a few minutes ago. He put such emphasis upon prayer. He so valued prayer that he turned on one occasion to a backslidden people. They were really backslidden. They wanted a king. They weren't satisfied with the theocracy reigned by God. They wanted to be like the other nations. All right, said Samuel. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. That we cease to pray for people because they are hard. Oh, said Samuel, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. No one was busier than Jesus. There were occasions when he hadn't time to eat, but he made time to pray. None of us has time to pray. In these days, we've got to make time. We have to learn to love God with our strength. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, the affections, the emotions, with thy mind, with the intellect, with thy strength. We don't live by feelings. We'll never build up holy character if we depend upon the tides of emotion which ebb and flow. That we must learn to love God with our strength. And so Jesus made time to pray. It's many years ago, I looked it up, I think not less than 50 times in the four Gospels alone, prayer and praying are mentioned in connection with the busiest man in the world, the Lord Jesus. Resolve that by his grace, you'll be a man, a woman of prayer. When is a swan at its best? In the water. Oh, how, what a wonderful sight, how graceful, such poise, such beauty to see a swan on the bosom of a lake. It's its God-appointed element. It's at its best in the water. But take it out of the water. See a swan flying, I have, how ungainly. At a disadvantage, it's out of its God-given element. When is an eagle at its best? In the air spreading its mighty pinions, sweeping into the sky, the king of the birds. But take an eagle out of the air and put it in the lake, it's bedraggled, uncomfortable, and Satan, who has had 6,000 years experience on human nature. Satan is a malignant being. There's a mystery about Satan. He was once the anointed cherub. And his covering was every precious stone. And he walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire, we read. And he was on the holy mountain of God. He was perfect in all his ways from the day that he was created till iniquity was found in him. Jesus called him a prince, the prince of this world cometh and findeth nothing in me. Of ourselves we are no match for the devil. How foolish some people are in their pride to think that they can overcome the devil. We can in the name of Jesus. We can by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we are weak, we are strong. I remember a man praying a prayer years ago. He said, Lord, strengthen me when I'm too weak and weaken me when I'm too strong. That's it. Good prayer, that. Satan, Satan is... In a thousand and one ways, the good becomes the enemy of the best. We become distracted in our service because we haven't taken time to pray. Or oh, may we ever be at our best, our best. Now I want to emphasize this morning what I feel is the more important side of prayer. For there are two sides, two hemispheres to prayer. The talking side <coughs> and the listening side. And the far more important side of prayer is listening. Why? Because God's got a voice. I'm afraid that many of us behave at times as if God were dumb, as if God hadn't got a voice. We do all the talking. We rush into God's pleasant presence. We pour out our petitions and we come away. But we haven't really entered into prayer. God's got a voice. He wants to speak. We shouldn't allow 24 hours to pass 
without having consciously heard the voice of God. My sheep hear my voice, said Jesus. In the original, of course, it's more emphatic. It's the, it's the present indicative tense. My sheep are listening to my voice. What a picture. Those are the sheep that never perish. Those are the sheep that will never perish. My sheep are listening to my voice and they are following me. Seven times over in the opening chapters of the Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, we have this injunction. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. What the Spirit saith unto the churches. Sometimes we behave as if there weren't a Holy Spirit. The early church was filled with power. We are filled with problems. Oh, the problems, the problems are the problems of the church. Well, God knows exactly what to do. It isn't our church in any case. It's his church. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I will build my church. You better listen to him. See, he's got to see what he's got to say. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. I was very blessed in looking at that book by Raymond Davis on fire on the mountain. He gives an account of the miracles of divine grace in Ethiopia. When the devil seemed to be having all his own way and the Italians, Italian soldiers followed by the Catholic priests took over Ethiopia for five years. Poor Haley Selassie had to flee for his life and came to Britain. By the way, I invited him to the Oldham Convention, but he couldn't come. Um, he came to this country as an exile, and uh, all the Protestant missionaries had to leave. But the Lord said, it's my church. I'll build my church. And so when the mission re missionaries returned at the end of five years, what did they find? In one area where there were 48 Christians, the 48 had grown to 10,000. The 40, you better read the book, Fire on the Mountains by Raymond Davis. And I just borrowed the book for a little time to read, of course. 48 Christians had grown to 10,000 Christians. The Lord knows what he's doing. Let's find out his plan. Let's take time to listen. The mighty Moses did most of the listening during those 40 days. I know he did some wonderful pleading. I know that he turned away the wrath of God from an apostate people. Where God said to Moses, let me alone. Fancy God saying that to Moses. Let me alone and I will destroy this people and make of thee a greater nation. And thus, of course, fulfill his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now Moses pleaded. Oh, he said, Lord, what will the Egyptians say if you destroy this people? They'll say that you hadn't power to take them out of the wilderness. And he argues with God and he marshals these arguments. And then he says, well, if you won't forgive this people, blot me out of thy book. He knew how to prevail. Yes, but he knew how to listen. He didn't do all the talking. God did most of the talking. And in that dark hour, when the people had worshipped the golden calf, they were about to be destroyed by a holy God. God had a plan. And Moses listened. And God unfolded his great plan. A tabernacle. A place in which he would dwell. In which he would manifest his glory. And he revealed to Moses every detail, the measurements, the materials, the ordinances. And again and again God said to Moses, See that thou do everything according to the pattern. Show thee where? In the mountain. Do we resort to the mount of prayer? Say, Lord, what's your pattern? There are no problems with thee, Lord. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. What has the Spirit said to us? Oh, that we should listen. 
Samuel became a great prophet. It was no, it was known he happened to advertise and look at I'm a prophet. Oh no, it was known to Dan, from Dan to be a Sheba. A man's gifts will make room for him. You aren't going to strive. I'm not being given my place. Nothing of the kind. God puts us in the body of Christ. God gives to us our, our, our function. He'll fit you right in. <clears throat> and so it is known from Dan to be a Sheba that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord and the Lord did let none of his words fall to the ground. Why? He'd learned to listen. Speak for thy servant. We want to speak with authority. We must first learn to listen. Solomon, I know that he died a fool because he had too many wives. they were foreigners they turned his heart away from God but God made him the wisest man who has ever lived apart from Jesus God gave him wisdom why because he said give to thy servant a hearing heart and the speech pleased the Lord he could have asked for gold he could have asked for long life he could have asked for many things but he made the best choice and life is full of choices you get what you believe for. You'll get what you win for. That's a law. Make your right choice. Be careful of the choices that you make. And Solomon made the right choice. Give thy servant a hearing heart. And he listened in to the counsels of the eternal one. And they came to the ends of the earth to listen to what Solomon had to say. I'm very fond of Isaiah. His book has been called the Gospel of Isaiah. Oh, the Catholicity of the, God, of the word of Isaiah. He saw a Christ whose gospel would be taken to the Gentiles. He was a wonderful man. And in the 50th chapter of his book, he says, The Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned. I was reading it this morning, and I lifted my heart to God instinctively. Oh, yes, Lord. The Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned that I may know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. Yes, but the, the verse goes on to give us the secret. The Lord wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord hath opened my ear. That's why he could speak. That's why he had the tongue of the learned because every morning he listened and the Lord opened his spiritual ears. God help us to listen. This is an age of noise, cacophony, discord, tension. Was it a Japanese doctor that said to Stanley Jones, he said tuberculosis is no longer killer number one in Japan. It used to be, it isn't now. It is high blood pressure, heart disease when he was asked the reason he said spiritual uneasiness we stop listening Jesus learned to listen I was reading this morning in John's gospel chapter 8 verse 30 I beg your pardon John's gospel chapter 5 verse 30 where Jesus said as I hear my judge and his judgment was unerring Never man spake like this man, said the soldiers who had been ordered to arrest him. He learned to listen. As I hear, he was listening to his father. As I hear, I, I judge. In chapter 8, verse 26 of John's Gospel, he said, He that hath sent me is true, speaking of his father. And I speak to the world the things I've heard of him. He spoke to the world the words he'd heard of his father. And the Holy Spirit listened. Here is a mystery. Uh, the Holy Spirit is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father and the Son. Eternal Spirit is called. But there is what we call a subordination of office. Each person in the Trinity has a special function. And so we read in John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 30, Jesus said to his disciples, When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. 
He will not speak of himself. The little word of is a preposition. And it means out from. Out from. The Holy Spirit said Jesus Christ. He will not speak out from himself. But whatsoever he shall hear. That shall he speak. What a revelation. Of the attitude of God the Holy Spirit. Listening to the Father. Whatsoever he shall hear. That shall he speak. If Jesus Christ had need to listen. We have need to listen. I haven't time this morning to deal with the benefits of listening. I've touched on them. Make it a study. Find out in the Bible the blessings promised to those who listen. Blessings of health in body. The blessing of vitality of soul. The blessing of wisdom and knowledge. Domestic blessings. National blessings. God is going to bring Britain down to the place where at last she listens. God is smashing us, breaking us. Thank God he's doing it. Until at last in our despair, we will lay aside our deadly doing and our economic programs as if those could bring us salvation. And we listen to the God of our fathers. We read in the first promise of healing in the Bible to a nation is given to us on condition that they listen. Uh, Exodus 15, 26. You remember the story that the children of Israel went to the waters of Marah and they were bitter and of course they grumbled at Moses. People always do that. If you say, oh, I'm going to be a leader, you must pay the price of leadership. Leaders are made by God. And oh, so they, they murmured at Moses. What did he do? Answer them back? Because he did once and paid for it for the rest of his life. When he answered the rebels at the waters of Meribah, at the water not Mara, the waters of Meribah later on when he struck the rock, must we bring water for you rebels? He spoke in advisedly. And he paid the price and God wouldn't allow him to enter Canaan. But oh, his life apart from that slip up was exemplary. And here he's tested and tried, he's got a nation on his shoulders. A race of liberated slaves. And they come to the waters of Mara and they couldn't drink and they murmured against Moses. What did Moses do? He cried unto the Lord. That's what we've got to do as leaders. It's our portion to be misunderstood. It's part of our training that people won't appreciate what we're doing. That's part of the training. You see, God's training you to be rulers <coughs> in the coming kingdom. That's what God is training you for, for eternity. And he's training us to be rulers in the coming kingdom. But most of us don't want God's way of training. It's the way of suffering. It's the way of overcoming. If we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. We prepared for that? Not to suffer as an evildoer. Not to suffer as a busy body. But to suffer as a Christian. It's part of the training. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. To him that overcometh, said Jesus to the ladies here, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. What does that mean? It means that Christ is not yet on his own throne. He's on his Father's throne. He conquered. He overcame. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I overcame, said Jesus, and I am now set down with my Father in his throne. But to you, you, if you will overcome, you shall sit with me in my throne. What a reward. And God made that offer to the church he was about to cast out of his mouth. The most gracious, the most wonderful of all the promises that Jesus made to the churches in, 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 in um, Asia Minor was to this church. Typical of, uh, of the church today that's neither hot nor cold, that's well organized. We are rich and increased with goods, we've need of nothing. Ah, said the Lord, you know not that you are poor and wretched and blind and miserable, you live warm. 
and because you're lukewarm I'll spew thee out of my mouth then the Lord says as many as I love I rebuke and chasten be zealous therefore and repent and then he says to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne all oh, the possibilities of lives all oh, you <coughs> fine young people will you allow the Holy Ghost to train you repay you for rulership when God wanted to make Joseph a ruler he allowed him to go to prison maybe for eight or nine years he hadn't done any wrong in fact he resisted evil he turned away the overtures of a wicked woman and he must have been I should think eight years if not more in prison because he was 17 years of age when he went to uh, to seek out his brethren and he was 30 when he stood before Pharaoh eight or nine years in prison for doing good his soul entered into iron the iron didn't enter into his soul thank God it didn't become bitter Satan's master stroke is to get it bitter and you see with an increase of knowledge we get to know human nature and the tendency is to become cynical never become cynical never become bitter if so you're finished you're finished the Lord never became bitter he knew that Peter would deny him he knew that they all would forsake him and flee but having loved his own he loved them unto the end and in prison here was God's university the devil said, my word, this is the result of holy living, Joseph. Oh, you've resisted evil. <laughs> Just the end of you. You're in a dungeon. The game isn't worth the candle. You're a fool, man. God was training him for rulership. Training him for rulership. And in God's appointed time, we read, out of prison he came to be the world's first food controller, to be prime minister of the then greatest empire in the world. God's way of training us if we suffer with him we shall reign with him if we overcome if we overcome live the life of victory in the Holy Ghost Paul was a good mathematician he said I reckon what did he write that the sufferings of this present age are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us our light affliction he said it's only for a moment you had an easy time then Paul you talk about uh, you were light affliction well he said well, just a minute I can see him taking his coat off and his waistcoat and his shirt and he stripped to the waist what a sight this man who said oh I reckon that the sufferings of this present day not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed our light affliction See him now five of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one hundred and ninety five stripes my well they laid them on I can show you thrice was he beaten with rods once he was stoned a day and a night floating in the water in weariness in painfulness in hunger and thirst and cold and nakedness perils in the sea, in the city, among robbers, among false brethren. Are you suffered, Paul? Oh, he said, it's light in comparison with the weight of glory. My affliction's only for a moment. But there's an eternal weight. You see, what a wonderful mathematician he was. He got the scales in front of him. In the one pan of the balances, he put his afflictions. Oh, there they were. Oh, he said they are light in comparison with the weight and the eternal weight. The eternal weight of glory. God help us. What time do you go to lunch? I can finish at any time, of course. I can always finish. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But with, this is a family gathering. <laughs> I can speak from my heart. This isn't uh, the homiletics hour. <laughs> <laughs> In Cliff College, Mr. Chadwick used to take us on Wednesday evenings on homiletics. Dr. 
what about was it now be? So I better not start. <laughs> we had to listen, aren't we? But now then, the benefits of listening. And the Lord said, we started about a quarter of an hour ago, talking about uh, w people at the waters of Mara. And we've gone into the book of the Revelation. In the meantime, we'll come back to the waters of Mara. <laughs> And uh, Moses, he, he cried to the Lord. You do that when the people grumble at you. He cried unto the Lord. And the Lord showed him a tree. God will show you what to do if you'll call upon him. And he cut the tree down. And threw the tree into the waters and they were healed. The picture, of course, of Jesus. Coming, cut down. Becoming sin for us that we might be healed. Anyhow, and then the Lord said this. Exodus 15:26. If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and wilt give ear to his commandments and statutes, then I'll heal you. Then I'll put none of these diseases upon thee that I put upon the Egyptians, for I am Jehovah Ophika. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I'm afraid that some people have a nervous breakdown when, when they shouldn't have it. I met a pilgrim many years ago. She was a wonderful pilgrim, but she was finished. Because she hadn't kept the statutes of God. Not only keep the Ten Commandments, moral law. Listen to me, said God. Listen to what I've got to tell you. Listen to my commandments and my statutes. And then I'll be your healer in body. There were many statutes in Israel concerning the health of his people. There was the law of sanitation. Nothing unclean to be seen when God walked through the camp. The law of sterilization, anticipating modern antiseptic methods. The law of segregation, quarantine, put the leper outside the camp. I've forgotten the date now when a terrible, terrible plague swept the world. People were dying in millions. Was it cholera? And then, Somebody said we'll, we'll go to the Bible method segregation. Quarantine. And the awful plague was stamped out. And the law of diet. Now I, I eat what's set in front of me of course. Travel in all sorts of places. But we must, uh, we must use common sense. What the old black man calls scientific gumption. <laughs> there was the law of uh, physical culture oh yes the priests had to walk they had to got their garden plots I haven't got one of course what little bit of lawn we've got my wife attends to that <laughs> but uh, and they had to walk hundreds of miles a year up to the feet and there was the law of uh, relaxation and preachers are guilty Many of them are not observing the Sabbath. We don't have a Sabbath a week. And uh, I speak, of course, to all both pilgrims and superintendents. Get your Sabbath. One in seven. The law of relaxation. And if we don't learn to relax, we'll crack up. Crack up. The devil would drive us. The Lord never drives us. Now, said the Lord, you listen to me. We have to learn to say no to men. We aren't the servants of men. We serve men, but we are God's servants. Listen to me, and I'll be the law that healeth you. We, uh, when the Lord healed Hezekiah, God said to Isaac, put a plaster of figs on that boy. It was a miracle. His life was spared an extra 15 years, but God used the means of nature. When Jesus he that little, uh, raised the little girl from the dead, he said, give her something to eat. Make use of the provisions of nature. If not, the miracle I perform will be blotted out. I raised her from the dead, give her something to eat. But something more important I must just touch on in passing, spiritual vitality. Some people are very stale in their souls. They're living on the past. You sense that the juice is gone. Like an orange that squeezed dry. 
like a sponge when all the water's been squeezed out of it. What's gone wrong? They've stopped listening. Haven't that quiet time with God? Haven't given God a chance to speak, to speak, to speak? You see, his voice is a quickening voice. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calm. It's a creative voice. David said, Thy word hath quickened me. And if ever I needed to be filled with spiritual vitalities is in these days. There's only one way, listening to God. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 3. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live. Divine life will keep flowing through us as we are listening. 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 I think of the story that Brash Bonsall tells. Mr. Brash Bonsall is the principal of the Birmingham Bible Institute. I didn't intend giving this story. Hope I can remember it properly. He tells the story of a vicar whose manse was next to the church. And every day about 12 o'clock he saw an old man, rather shabbily dressed, poor man, go into the church and come out at five past twelve. So being curious, he said to the verger, that's a polite name for the caretaker, he said, uh, <laughs> he said, who's that old man that goes in every day to the church, comes out at five past twelve, what's he do? Well, I don't know, sir, said the verger. But he goes in and he walks down to the front to the communion rail, takes his hat off and he stands there for five minutes and he goes out. So the vicar's curiosity got the better of him. So he met the old man one day and he said something like this, excuse me, he said, uh, I notice you, that you go into my church every day at 12 o'clock and you come out at five past 12, what do you do? Well, sir, said the old man, I'm very ignorant. I don't know much about prayer, but I go and I stand there at the communion rail and I bow my head and I say, Lord, it's Jim. Lord, it's Jim. And I stand there, see, waiting on the Lord. And I come away. One day Jim was missing. He'd had an accident. And they rushed him to the hospital. And the vicar found out where he was. And he went to the hospital, to the ward where Jim was lying. And the sister in charge, the nurse in charge, said to the vicar, something's happened in this ward since old Jim arrived. It was the worst ward in the hospital before. They were always grumbling and complaining, but now there's such peace. It's changed since old Jim came in. So the vicar went up to Jim. He said, Jim, God is making you a blessing in this ward. What's happened? And so it's like this, said the old man. I can't go to your church now. But every day at 12 o'clock, the Lord comes. And he seems to stand at the foot of my bed. I hear him say, Jim, it's the Lord. <laughs> Jim, it's the Lord. If we will stand before him, say, Lord, I'm very helpless. But Lord, I can listen. Lord, it's Jim. Or it's Jack. Or it's Maynard, Lord. And then he'll come to us. He'll say, my son, it's the Lord. How does God speak? Mainly through his word. Also by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And then through one another. That's how God speaks. Read his word. No time to go into this now. Doesn't mean that you stick pins in the Bible and ask God to help you at random. Oh no. But God will speak through his word. Daniel was reading the prophecies of Jeremiah. And through reading that word he understood God's word, will. He heard God's voice for Judah. That at the end of 70 years God would restore the captivity of Judah. And of course uh, Daniel wasn't a hyper-Calvinist. 
He believed in the sovereignty of God. He told uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the most high ruler in the kingdom of men. Yes, but he believed in entering into partnership with God. He heard God's voice. He found out God's will. What did he do? He set himself by prayer and fasting and supplication to bring about the fulfillment of God's will. At the end of 70 years, 50,000 mainly from Judah returned. God speaks through his word. I remember many years ago I didn't obey God's word. I was sanctified. Bit of a harem scarum, I suppose. And we wanted to buy a tent. We were going out pioneering for God. I put my furniture into store for the time being. For I have a very wonderful wife. And we thought we must have a tent now. Off we'll go. So a friend of mine took me to a very reputable firm in the, in the, uh, in the Midlands. Near Birmingham. Very fine firm and they showed us a tent. 65 pounds. Oh if it, if it was a new tent it would be I don't know how much money. And it seemed fine, splendid firm, and my friend said, that's fine, that's the tent. So I stayed the night in Birmingham with the late Reverend Buckus Pinch. I didn't know him, only on an introduction, but my other friend, uh, I knew quite well. So I stayed the night in the home of Buckus Pinch. And so before going to bed, I said, well now, Lord, just give me a word about this tent, will you? Well, I'd asked the Lord for a word, and he gave me a word. It was in Ezekiel, chapter 7. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn. Now what would you have done? What would you have done? The devil said, nonsense. If you tell Mr. Pinch in the morning that you've had a word from the Lord not to buy the tent, he'll think you were a holiness crank. <coughs> See, I didn't know Mr. Pinch very much. So I reasoned it out that no, this isn't from the Lord, but I'd ask the Lord to speak to me. And the Lord has spoken to me. But oh no, we bought the tent. And it was a washout. The rain poured in. I'd learned my lesson. God speaks. There are some of you wondering what your future sphere will be in the Lord's vineyard. 